Osborne Malecki on the Board of Trustees for the East Hampton Historical Society. Thank you for coming out tonight to enjoy the first of the East Hampton Historical Society's Winter Lecture Series. Tonight's presentation on Millers, Millwrights, and Early Trades in East Hampton. Our lecture series this year celebrates East Hampton at work, looking back at those who helped build the town. First, we want to thank the East Hampton Library for hosting our lecture in this beautiful space. Our next lecture for your calendar is March 3rd, when Ken Cullum will talk about the blacksmiths of East Hampton. Our speaker tonight, Bob Hefner, has been a gift to East Hampton. His knowledge of all things East Hampton stretches far and wide. His expertise is behind numerous historic structure reports documenting the history of many of the town's most significant buildings. He has contributed to the preservation of numerous important structures, such as the Thomas and Mary Nemo Moran Studio, the Gardner Mill Cottage, and the Domini Shops. As the village preservation advisor, he has assisted village boards with some of the most important zoning legislation enacted during his years. He knows more about our windmills than just about anybody else and has overseen the restoration of a number of them. It's a pleasure to welcome back Bob Hefner. So my talk uh, tonight will be inspired by the opportunity of the Domini Shops along with the Hook Mill. <laughs> will provide for bringing to life a variety of crafts, trades of old East Hampton. The 1880 photograph you see here, uh, the Domini House is to the right, and you're looking south to the Hook Mill. This, of course, was before the railroad cut off this beautiful vista. So you can all see this is the Domini House, the woodworking shop is right there, clock shop is right there. This was, this was really the good old days. The Domini Shocks and the Hook Mill tell the story of many crafts, from the finer arts of clock making and cabinet making to all kinds of woodworking, metalworking, mill writing, timber framing, and the trade of the miller. The Domini Woodworking Shop is one of only three 18th century furniture shops in America. Nowhere else in the country are a clock shop and woodworking shop of this period together in one structure. Combine this with a nearby hook mill built by Nathaniel Dominey. Even throw in the Dominey wind-powered sawmill that stood across Theater Street. And we have here a richness of historic trades and early technology unique in the country. The historical Society, who will be operating the Dominey shops, and the village with the hook mill have the challenge of bringing this history alive. My talk will concentrate on the trades of the miller and the millwright, focusing on the hook mill. This circa 1880 painting by E.L. Henry shows the hook mill when it was owned by and operated by Nathaniel Dominey VII. You see a farmer unloading uh, sacks of grain from his wagon. The grist mill was an essential part of life in an agrarian community. Wind-powered gristmill was an especially complex and expensive machine. Windmills were so costly to construct that they usually were owned by companies rather than just one person, and the, the company would then employ the miller. A story written down by Jeanette Edwards Rattray is accurate in stating the importance of the miller in early East Hampton. One Sabbath morning when all the good people of East Hampton had gathered in the meeting house, the wind sprang up after a long period of calm. The minister closed his Bible and announced, Brethren, the meeting is dismissed. Hunting Miller, go to your mill. <laughs> so Hunting Miller's windmill at that time stood right opposite the meeting house on Mill Hill. And that's now the Pantigo Mill. I'll go through the different tasks in operating the hook mill that the miller went through. <clears throat> operating a wind-powered grist mill is a skill that is lost locally, and I don't know of any operating wind-powered grist mill in America. Windmills do remain active in England and the Netherlands, where the profession of miller is very much alive. 
When the miller arrived at his mill, his first task was to orient the sails in the direction of the wind. This photo is one of many in this talk taken by the photographer Jet Lowe during the 1977 recording project of the Historic American Engineering Record. I was historian for this project and worked with Jet Lowe. And the two of us, I remember, revolving the cap of the hook mill to turn the sails to the north to get this picture from the North End Cemetery. Here is the system of gears and shafts used to revolve the cap and sails. This internal system of gears was invented by Nathaniel Dominey Five and first used here in the hook mill. Here you see the two capstan bars set into a shaft at the first floor. Walking these around revolved the second shaft that extends up to the cap where another gear engage, engages with cogs that on the cap circle. Here's the capstan and the bars that you walk around. And in the drawing, here's the capstan, and that engages with this gear. Shaft goes up to the cap, and there's a little face gear here. So that system, you know, very slowly turns the cap around. And here's the face gear at the top of that shaft, engaging with a giant ring of cogs uh, at the base of the cap. If you haven't seen this in operation, it seems impossible that this small gear turned by two people at the first floor would revolve the heavy cap carrying the wind shaft and sails. But Nathaniel Dominey, he, he knew his uh, gearing. This 1880s photograph of the hook mill was also taken before the railroad. Uh, you can see the chimney of the Dominey house and the White House on the right is now still there on Akabonic Road just before the railroad. So there's the house on Akabonic Road with Railroad Pass. It goes right through here now. And there's the Dominey, there's the Dominey House and the Talmadge House. You can see the canvas uh, sails furled tightly on the sail frame. They look like ropes. When not in use, a wooden band around the brake wheel held the wind shaft and sails in a fixed position. The miller would release the brake and bring one sail down to the ground. He then climbed up the sail frame to unfurl and tie off the canvas sail at the four corners. This photo, uh, Charles Dominey, the miller from 1939 to 1941, has tied off one sail and is bringing around the next one. And you can see the, the very tight furling of the sail so that it doesn't catch any wind. So then Charles had to climb up, or the young man he was with here, uh, had to climb up the sail frame, unfurl it, and tie it, tie it off. He let the brake off and then bring the next one down. This photograph and many others are from the East Hampton Library's Digital Long Island resource. So with the sails pointed into the wind and the canvas tied on, the miller releases the brake wheel and away she goes. Uh, Dave Collins and the DPW crew deserve great credit for this awesome sight. This drawing shows the main machinery of a windmill. The sails are mortised into a wind shaft contained in the framing of the cap. As the sails were turned by the wind, a large gear mounted, mounted on the wind shaft, known as the brake wheel, engaged another gear, known as the wallower, transmitting the motion down into the mill tower. Mounted in, on the upright shaft is a spur gear that drove pinions <coughs> mounted to iron spindles that in turn revolve the millstones. The photo on the right shows the wind shaft brake wheel engaged with the wallower. So here we have obviously the wind shaft, the sails, the brake wheel, the wallower turning the upright shaft down to the second floor with a great spur wheel turning the lantern pinions which turn the upper millstone. Mm -hmm. 
On the left is the great sprue wheel on the second floor that drives the two pair of millstones. Here's one of the pair of the millstones. The lower stone rests on two large girders and is stationary. The upper stone is revolved by the iron spindle. Grain is deposited in the hopper to fall into the shoe, which is vibrated back and forth by the turning spindle. This trickles the grain into the eye of the stone. And you'll see, uh, in a short time, you'll see an operating mill. And you'll see all this in sort of in action. The furrows cut in the stones keep crossing each other like a succession of scissor blades and cut the grain. The cut grain is driven outward by this action of the furrows and by centrifugal force. For the millstones to operate correctly, the miller had to constantly make adjustments. The revolving upper stone is supported by an iron spindle resting on a large wood lever <coughs> called a bridge tree. In the photo, the bridge tree pivot is to the right. The base of the iron spindle supporting the millstones is a little to the left. And way out at the end is a threaded rod that raises or lowers the outer end of the bridge tree. So you can see how a slight take up. Here's, here's the bridge tree. This is the iron spindle that supports the upper stone. So it turns on that. Pivot point is here. The way at the end you can low, raise or lower this timber and by the function of the lever, a very, very slight take up on this screw would raise the millstone just a tiny, tiny hundredths of an inch or less. So the miller could make a very fine uh, adjustment of the space between the stones. So in perfectly balanced and space, the upper and lower stones were very close but were not touching. Uh, they were so close that only a piece of brown paper bag could be placed between the two stones at the center and only a piece of tissue paper between them at the periphery. So it, was, it was quite an art to get it all set up. The most difficult job of the miller was to maintain the cutting surfaces of the millstones. Periodically, the pharaohs would need sharpening and the surface fairing. The stone crane seen here in the hook mill was used to lift the upper stone, swing it over, and set it down with the furrows turned upward for sharpening. In this photo of an English miller, the upper stone is set to the floor on the left, and the miller is sharpening the furrows of the bedstone using a stone chisel set in a wood handle. We, we have the same tool that was used in the hook mill we have in the, in the collection, Home Sweet Home. Uh, this dressing of the millstones was a fine art. Besides the sails, gearing, and millstones, the miller had other machinery to operate and maintain. For moving grain within the mill, there was a sack hoist and a grain elevator. There was a screener for cleaning the grain before grinding. A grain bolter and corn bolter sifted the meal into different grades of flour and corn meal. Uh, there's a tremendous difference between a static windmill and an operating mill. Only when the windmill and its machinery come alive does it really speak to us. To get some idea of the motion, sound, and workings, we'll see if we can get this video of a windmill in uh, Lincolnshire, England. <laughs>
quite a difference when it comes alive. <laughs> Does anyone here remember when you could buy flour in Hook Mill? <laughs> yep. <laughs> now we will consider the millwright, particularly the work of Nathaniel Dominey Five, who was Long Island's premier designer and builder of windmills in the early 19th century. Nathaniel Dominey is, the, is best known for making furniture, but for the seven years from 1804 to 1810, when he devoted about a third of his time to building windmills, he was primarily a millwright. From the age of 34 in 1804 to the age of 40 in 1810, Dominey was at his prime. His furniture and his windmills equally display his skill and ingenuity. These drawings of the frame and machinery of the hook mill were done in 1977 by the Historic American Engineering Record. The windmill is a complex machine and a masterpiece of timber framing. The tapering octagonal tower has a dense timber frame where all the mortise and tenon joints are cut at an angle. On the top of the tower is a large wood ring and another wood ring is at the base of the cap. By comparison, the timber frame of a house or barn is quite simple. The mill is full of machinery. The machinery and structure had to be planned together. The structure had to be wide enough for the millstones to have a base to withstand the thrust of the wind on the sails. But any extra width would only serve to block the wind. The height of the mill was planned for sails large enough to power the machinery. The result was this narrow, tapering octagonal tower topped by a cap just large enough to contain the brake wheel. For such a complicated structure where the timber frame and the machinery are integrated, the project had to begin with a design phase. We know that Dominey drew plans and that he traveled to look at other mills for new ideas. When Nathaniel Dominey built a fulling mill in Sagaponic in 1801, he charged the mill owners for going to Riverhead to draw a mill. <laughs> News of a new filling mill in Riverhead had reached Dominey and he went to draw it up and take ideas from it. This is an interior view of the hook mill. All the framing timber is white oak from Gardner's Island. The vertical, the vertical post is hewn from a straight log, 20 inches in diameter and 28 feet in length. The horizontal beam to the right is riven on the outer face, a log split in two through the heart, and is sawn on the other three sides. The braces are sawn on all four sides. That was done by the uh, Dominey wind-powered sawmill on Cedar Street, which I'll talk about in a little while. Dominey's windmill frames have a very high aesthetic quality and are the highest expression of the timber framer's craft in East Hampton. <clears throat> Let's look at one innovation made by Nathaniel Dominey in framing the cap of the hook mill. Nathaniel Dominey combined the forms of a conical cap and a gable roof for the cap of the hook mill. The middle of the cap is framed like a cone with rafters radiating from the central round timber block to a circular plate. At the gable ends, rafters extend from the circular plate to a ridge pole. The result is a graceful transition from a central cone to gable end walls. Dominey's inventive roof frame is key to the elegant appearance of the hook mill. Uh, and this cap is a signature of the Dominey Mills. It's a wonder that no one else uh, did this. The other mills are cones with gables, and then in, say, in, um, in New England, they have a straight gable roof overhanging, but to combine, to put a gable roof on a circular plate, which is really what this is, is quite something. The relationship between fashioning clockworks and mill gearing is obvious. The understanding of gear relationships is the same, although the scale is quite different. We do know that Dominey planned the gears for the hook mill by drawing them out full size on the attic floor of the Dominey house. Hmm. Charles Dominey wrote an account of these mill patterns uh, before the house was demolished. Coming back to the Dominey shops, on the left is the interior of the woodworking shop as it is today on North Main Street. 
Here Nathaniel made many components of the hook mill, including the mill gears. On the upper right is a gauge now at Winter 2 Museum used by Dominie when turning rounds to different diameters. The rounds of the wallower seen on the left have a larger diameter than those of the lantern pinions that turn the millstones. The beautiful stone crane seen at the lower center was made by Nathaniel in the shop. This is a utilitarian machine fashioned like a piece of furniture. It is square in section at the mortise joints, small lamb's tongue stops made the transition to the chamfers and to the round at the top. The brace could have been straight, but Dominie selected a naturally curved piece of wood. On the left is the uh, forge at the Dominic Clock Shop. This is the, the uh, historic, historic American Building Survey photo from 1940. And here many windmill components were made and repaired over the years. At the upper center is a wrought iron spindle that revolved the upper millstones. The spindle has a graceful transition from a square at the top to the octagonal shaft. At the upper right are bands for a lantern pinion. And at the bottom is a roller race on which the cap revolves. The iron roller race was between the wood rings at the top of the tower and the base of the cap. And you can see the, um, this is a little track on the top of the tower, little cast iron rollers in a wrought iron held in two wrought iron bands. A little update on restoration work at the Domini uh, shops. Phil and Jim Cangelosi have begun reconstructing the clock shop forge using all 18th century bricks, many salvaged when the Domini house was taken down in 1946, and pure lime putty mortar, the same type used when the forge was built in 1799. Now we'll look at an intriguing aspect of the work of Nathaniel Dominey V, construction of wind-powered sawmills. This is a rare type of mill. <coughs> the frame of a Dominey wind-powered sawmill survives on Gardner's Island, and this is the only example in America. England has one surviving wind-powered sawmill, and there are two or three in the Netherlands, and at least one of them is still sawing logs. Seen here is an 1860 survey of what was known as the Dominey Mill Lot, which is the present site of the um, Southampton Historical Farm Museum. So this is, this is North Main Street and uh, Three Mile Harbor Road. This is Cedar Street. The Farm Museum is here. This is the wind-powered sawmill. Dominey House is right here. So not only did the Dominies have a woodworking shop, a clock shop, or metalworking shop, a forge, they also had a sawmill right next door. Um, were there any other 18th century craftsmen in rural America who had a manufacturing setup like this? Two. Just to go through it again, we, here's the Dominie house, the clock shop, which had a work, uh, work room for, you know, cold metal working and then the forge for the blacksmith. Clock shop at the north end with uh, workbenches and two lathes for all kinds of woodworking. And then this course is the uh, <coughs> farm museum across Cedar Street and the windmill would have been like right about in here. Remaining on Gardner's Island today is the frame of a dominie built wind-powered sawmill. <clears throat> and on the photo on the right, the sawmill is the taller structure. By the time uh, this photo was taken, it had been added onto and converted into a residence. The drawing of the mill frame on the left was done by Frank Dayton. The entire mill revolved on wheels at the corners. 
the wind shaft incorporated a crank that moved the saw frame up and down. The logs and lumber were processed through the mill from side to side to be away from the turning sails. In, in uh, 1798, Dominey built a second wind-powered sawmill on Gardner's Island, which was larger and more complicated than this one. John Lyon Gardner provided an account of the second windmill in his journal and farm book. William Johnson Rysom had a double-geared sawmill built by Dat Dominey. <clears throat> it will saw 500 feet in a day with a very brisk wind with two saws. It was taken down from the top of Study Hill and put aboard Captain Clark's sloop to go to New York, from thence in an armed ship to the Bay of Honduras to saw mahogany. Goes out in an armed ship on account of the French. So now we have Nathaniel Dominey, millwright on the world scene. His sawmill is on an armed merchant ship bound for Honduras at the beginning of the undeclared war known as the Quasi War that primarily involved the French Navy harassing American merchant ships in the Caribbean. From a 19th century Dutch millwright's guide, we get some idea of the machinery within the Dominey sawmill that was shipped to Honduras. Gardner described the mill as being double geared and as having two saws. So the saws were not driven directly by the wind shaft as in that surviving example in Gardner's Island, but they had intermediate gearing. The setup would be something like these images of a large Dutch wind powered sawmill. The brake wheel and wallower would drive a vertical shaft just as a grist mill. The great spur wheel would be a face gear with teeth on the underside to turn a lantern pinion on horizontal shaft as seen in the upper photo at the center. So just to go through it here, so this is in the drawing, so the cap is up above the brake wheel and wallower and the great spur wheel, just like in a grist mill. But instead of turning two vertical uh, spindles for the stones, it's turning a horizontal shaft. So here's the great spur wheel with teeth on the bottom instead of the sides, turning a lantern pinion that is, you know, vertical, turning a shaft with cranks on the shaft, cranks here. So as the spindle turns, the cranks go up and down with reciprocal motion. And the shaft comes down from the crank to a frame saw, which goes up and down. This is the one in the Dutch windmill, uh, which operates today as a commercial mill. It says it's the only one in the world. And you see there's like four or more saws here to saw one log into boards with one pass. In the illustration, you can see that with multiple saws. So certainly the Dominey's mill was not as big or powerful as this one, but I think the relationship of uh, gearing and the saw frame was probably similar. Uh, the wind-powered sawmill shipped to Honduras is intriguing because it's such a rare and remarkable machine. Where did Dominey learn about a windmill like this? Did William Rysom bring a drawing from an English mill in Honduras? Had Dominey traveled somewhere himself to see a mill like this? So just think of the thought and planning that went into the designing this sawmill. There's so much more to the story of Dominey craftsmanship than clocks and furniture. Now we come to the final theme of my talk, which is the revival of the hook mill as an operating grist mill from 1939 to 1955. The story begins with Nathaniel Dominey VII, the son of Felix and grandson of Nathaniel V. Nathaniel VII was 25 years old when his grandfather died in 1852, so he had the opportunity to learn from the master. Beginning in the 1870s, Nathaniel Dominey VII owned both the hook mill and the Panigo mill and was the miller for both. In the 1874 illustration on the right, the hook mill is in the foreground 
and the Pantico Mill is further east on Pantico Road. Now on the left is Nathaniel Seven, about 1875, with his family. And this photo is from Averill Geis' book, Sea to Sea. Nathaniel's youngest boy, Charles Dominey, became the miller at the revived Hook Mill in 1939. Nathaniel Seven was described by a New York writer in 1883 as the village miller, farmer, carpenter, shipwright, clockmaker, tooth puller, whaler, <laughs> photographer, fisherman, and politician. Nathaniel Seven operated the Hook Mill until 1908, and it then became an antique store, as we see in this photo. One of the first acts by the newly incorporated village was to purchase the Hook Mill from the Vet Domini family in 1922. Do we know who this gentleman is? <laughs> So this is uh, Judson Bannister, who was village mayor from 1936 to 1954. On the left, he's at the LVIS 50th anniversary fair in 1945, and on the right, dressed as a pilgrim, at the 1948 tricentennial celebration. Mayor Bannister loved East Hampton history. <laughs> in 1938, he had repairs made to the Hook Mill, and in 1939, he engaged Charles Dominey to get the machinery in order and grind grain. Mayor Bannister tried to save the Dominey House in the 1940s, and in 1947, he commissioned Jeanette Edwards Rattray to write and publish the booklet, The Old Hook Mill, to be sold in the mill, along with the flour and cornmeal. On the left is uh, Charles Dominey, known as Puff Dominey from the East Hampton Star of August 31, 1939, with the heading, Veteran Miller at the Hook. The caption reads, Charles Dominey will someday be one of, Charles Dominey, Miller at the restored Hook Mill, who predicts that the mill will someday be one of our major attractions to tourists. <laughs> Dominey recalls when he operated the mill as a teenager in the 1890s. He told the Star reporter, you come down here when we start grinding, and I guarantee you'll have some cornbread the like of which you never dreamed of. <laughs> Maurice Lester took over as Miller in 1942 after Puff Dominey sold the Dominey house and moved to Massachusetts. Maurice grew up in the Little Cape on North, Street, on North Main Street opposite the mill. The East Hampton Star wrote that he learned milling as a boy, helping Nathaniel Seven at the Hook Mill. Star reported in 1945 that the old Hook Mill now turns out three kinds of wheat flour and two of cornmeal, under the supervision of Maurice Lester, the village miller. The flour is 25 cents for three pounds, the cornmeal 25 cents for two pounds. Maurice Lester noted that people send for it from all over the United States and I keep filling orders year-round. The operating windmill was immensely popular. The Star reported in January 1952, Maurice Lester of Hook Mill tells us that 1951 set a high mark with 8,148 visitors signing the visitors book. The highest month was August with 3,182 visitors. So the mill indeed had become uh, one of the village's major attractions. Maurice Lester died in December 1955. <clears throat> this photograph of Mr. Lester on the front page of the Star is captioned, standing in the doorway of the Old Hook Mill, where he served as Miller from 1942 until his last illness a few months ago. The white cape on the left is the house he lived in all his life. And the house is still there, just south of the railroad. The fall of 1955 was the last time grain was ground at the Hook Mill. Charles Dominey and Maurice Lester had learned how to operate the mill from Nathaniel Dominey 7. The trade of the miller operating a wind-powered gristmill in East Hampton extended from 1657 to 1955. This skill passed on from generation to generation for 300 years 
came to an end with the death of Maurice Lester. Rather than conclude on that rather sad note, let's look at the revival of other traditional crafts today. While we're waiting for a miller to grind grain in an American windmill again, other trades and crafts have seen a revival in the past few decades. The Dominate Shops project has already demonstrated the craft of timber framing using traditional hand tools. Here is Dale Emd of the New Jersey Barn Company at work on the frame of the Dominate House. Blacksmithing is another revived craft. The Springs blacksmith, James DeMartis, is forging ironwork for the clock shop restoration, including the wrought iron lintels of the workroom, fireplace, and forge flue. And as Hillary said, uh, Ken Cullum will be talking about uh, East Hampton's blacksmiths in the next lecture. There's been an equal revival in furniture making with traditional hand tools. A scene like this at the left in the Anthony Hay cabinet shock at Williamsburg may be found at the workbench in the restored Domini shops at the right in the next uh, year or months. The Dominie Shops Museum and Hook Mill can tell the story of the Dominie family of craftsmen and also celebrate the revival of traditional crafts today. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to answer any <laughs> questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, I noticed I'm looking at the windmills. There seem to be uh, a lot of wear on the circular pieces from the teeth. Were they replaceable? Oh, yes. They were certainly replaced a, a number of times. <clears throat> the rounds were replaced. The cogs were replaced. And if you look in the Domini account books, there, quite often there is uh, mention of that. How often did the stones have to be replaced, and where did they get them from? So there are two in the uh, hook mill, there are two uh, different kinds of stones. The photograph of the stone crane had a solid granite stone, which would have come from Connecticut. The stone with the uh, plaster of Paris covering it was uh, a French granite called the burr stone from a particular um, quarry in France, very, very fine, hard. That was used for the wheat. The other one was used for cornmeal. Uh, in the Domini account books, Nathaniel Seven went to, um, the, bought, there's an account of him buying the birthstone in New York. So they, that was something done at that time. And, and how often they had to dress them, I, I'm not really, this I don't know. Uh, when, what's the angle of the sails on the windmill in relationship to the direction of the wind, and how much wind can it take before they got to turn it off? <laughs> well, for the angle, you can go look at the hook mill. They are the, um, when I was, you know, 1977, when I was researching for the windmill book and whatnot in the Long Island room with Dorothy King, we found a drawing by Nathaniel Dominey Seven of, the, of how to make the sail points to the hook mill. This is a drawing about this long. And it had in there <clears throat> the uh, angle of the stocks, the angle built into the sail point by cutting a slice, a bevel here and a bevel there. And also the twist, it has a twist like an airplane propeller. Each mortise has a different angle. So it is quite, um, it's quite something. And what, what was the other? How much is too, how much wind is too much? Oh. <laughs> when is it time to reef, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and when is it time to stay in the harbor? <laughs> so the, uh, you could reef the sails uh, at three different points. They had what's one called uh, dagger sails, where it was just a, like a little point, like a storm trisail. 
uh, you wouldn't want to get be operating if, if the miller thought it was a storm was coming, the wind was going to get stronger and stronger and too strong, then he wouldn't operate the mill because it, it, was, it is difficult to stop it if it's going too fast. So he had to plan, he had to be pretty sure that he'd have a steady, what he would want, steady wind. And, um, and as you know, Nathaniel Dominey had something called the wind, weather, and some other, and doings book, something like that. So he wrote down the w weather every day with the wind. So they were students of the wind. Uh, yeah, I, I've lived in East Hampton all my life, but I've always heard that East Hampton had more English windmills than any other town uh, in the country. Is that true? It's true of America, yes, absolutely. Are any of them really functioning? I mean, they all, did they all turn? Uh, no. Okay, good enough. <laughs> no, the, I mean, the hook mill, I mean, for turning, it's different. Turning the sails is one thing. Turning the machinery is a completely different thing. In the village, we have turned hook mill and gardener mill. Um, I think Sylvester Manor, that they're getting that so that that can turn. Some of the others don't. The, I mean, everything, the, um, turning the cap of the hook mill. So when you think 1955, it was in tip-top shape. When I first time I was there and turned it was only 20 years later. But now it's 46 years later. Now it doesn't turn anywhere. I don't think it turns at all. So, um, no, it's a big deal to make, they, of course at Williamsburg, they, when I was first here in 77, they, an uh, English millwright that built a Flower Dew 100 windmill in Virginia, a guy named John Sass, and he uh, was, op was operating as a wind-powered grist mill. And I think that was, that's been abandoned now. The one at Williamsburg I don't think is working anymore. So it's, it's a big project to get one. We thought when I was first here, we thought we would try to do that. And um, John Sass was going to get a miller from England, but that never happened. <laughs> yes. And on was there wind every day because it's near the ocean? What happened if there was no wind? No, it's just like now. <laughs> no, the thing about a windmill, I mean, obviously, anywhere that you could build a water mill, you would build a water mill because that's it's easier to operate and it's much steadier and dependable. But here, there's although in water mill there is the one wa there is one water mill because there's a little built a little head of <coughs> of water in the ponds. Uh, but in East Hampton, that really wasn't possible, so they built windmills. And um, yeah, you had, to, you had to grind when you could, and if you couldn't grind, you couldn't grind, so. But I think they relied on, they did a lot of grinding in October. You can tell from this annual Domini 7 account books, he, gro he ground grain 132 days a year. Mostly, most active months were October and November when you do have more wind. Could you talk a little bit about the cost? Because they were very, very expensive at that time. What would be relative now to that expense? Um, I think once I tried to figure that out, but the, the mill that we know the most about cost was the uh, Gardner Mill, and that was 528 pounds. And I think I recall that at that time, the only, in East Hampton there was the annual uh, assessment. Only one property was assessed at more than 500 pounds, that was Gardner's Island. So it was pretty, pretty big deal and Hook Mill had eight uh, people who contributed the money to build it and they were some of the wealthiest people. So it was a, it was a big, uh, major, major project but <coughs> They, they built hook mill they built in seven months <laughs> so now we're used to you know projects going on and on and on you know, with power tools and all kinds of stuff so <laughs> they, they they worked hard and 
long days, I guess. Anyone else? Thank you very much.